Okay, let's start with a prayer in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful and kindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit and they shall be created and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, by the light of the Holy Spirit, to just instruct the hearts of thy faithful. Grant that by that same spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so as you can see by the title of this presentation, we're going to talk about two things. Side-by-side -side realities, I would call them. The first is the way of the Antichrist, the dragon, the harlot, and the beast. And the second is the, the idea of, um, I call it a unary duality um, in all social and religious action. So like in all things, all your communication, there's, there's, there's a oneness to it. There's like a, but there's also a dark kind of second uh, force going on in every communication you have. We're going to use Old Testament. James Lindsay, we're going to have a little quote from the Old Testament. James Lindsay has a talk on this uh, similar concepts and St. Hildegard uh, of Bingen to elaborate on this idea. Mikael Himala, Hakadosh, again, Aleno Bakrav, Hagir, Aleno Matana, Haresha, Vaharamumiut, Shel Hasatan. Nisik sivot hashemayem tzorok lo gehenom et beliel, vet kora shedim shelo shemis dovivim po'alam, umikapsin et choran aneshamot. Amin. Okay, so um, now we're going to go forward here. Um, so... We're going to go through just quickly the scripture reading of the apocalypse around the, the, the figures of, you couldn't hear the audio from the computer? Okay. Okay. Um, we're going to go through the, um, the, the dragon from, um, from the apocalypse. Um, we're going to talk about the, the book of Revelation and, and when it when it concerns um, the dragon and the three beasts and the woman. And we're going to go over there just the reading, just going to read it first. And then we're going to talk about um, an interpretation of that. So first, Apocalypse 12, she was pregnant and crying out in pain and agony of giving birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, a huge red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, and seven royal crowns on his head. His tail swept a third of the stars from the sky, tossing them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, ready to devour her child as, she, as soon as she gave birth. And now we'll talk about the dragon and the beast, the first beast coming up from the sea. Chapter 13, the dragon stood on the shore of the sea and I saw a beast coming out of the sea and it had 10 horns and seven heads with 10 crowns on its horns and, one of, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but that fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. The people worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worshipped the beast and asked, who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place with those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. And then continuing the same chapter, whoever hears, let him hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity, they will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword, they will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb. 
but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people because of the signs it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast. It deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. So then we go forward, and so there's an inter, inter, um, interlude, you'd say, where we have a lot of activity happening, fallout with the saints, those being separated from God, the martyrs happening. Um, and then we have, we have a, a, a culmination happening where the plagues of wrath are about to be pour, poured out on the earth. And we have the introduction of the third beast and the woman riding it. One of the seven angels who had seven bulls came and said to me, this is chapter 17, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters with her kings of the earth committing adultery. And, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in spirit into the wilderness, where I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand, filled with the abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. The name written on her forehead was a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes in the abomination of the earth. And I saw the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Yeshua. So a quick overview before going forward. I'm giving here what I want to do with my interpretation here. It's a functional analogy, and it doesn't matter if this is what the prophecy was meant to mean, um, because ultimately I'm just trying to talk about how this can be used in our lives. So this is actually an aid to understanding what we are certainly dealing with in our lives, and it doesn't matter if it was prophesied this way or not, or whether it means that. These are things just to think about in terms of um, what we're talking about. So first of all, the dragon, right? So when I look at this in terms of the historical, we're going to talk about a historical model first, but we're going to bring it closer afterwards. If we talk about it in terms of a historical model, you can see the the tra the traits of the dragon. So how, what what is a dragon in, the, in the, the the serpent in the book of Genesis? He the, what is associated with and also throughout the scripture and tradition, associated with the dragon is the statement, "Non servium," right? I will not serve. And so the dragon does not, it says, I reject being under authority. And that's kind of the, the heart of his, his, uh, his message. And the non servium of the dragon matches that the non servium of Luther and masonry through Luther. I would say masonry is a managing faculty of, of Protestantism. And so we have Luther and, 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 um, and King Henry VIII both, both making very clear statements of non Servium, and then those their followers saying, and again, it's got imagery. It's coming out of the it's coming out of the sea. Well, the sea represents the many peoples. It represents popular group, the popular, the populace, right? So coming out of the populace of Europe, you have this dragon that's ready to devour the righteous son of God, right? That's being born through the natural function mother to son, right? Through the normal order of 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 hierarchy and, and descendancy, when you have a descendant that comes from the mother, it's saying, "I will not serve," and it wants to devour the son of the church, the son of God that's coming through his his faithful church on earth. And then, um, what's really interesting here is we have the ninety five theses. So again, these were all statements of um, the second kind of thing that we see with the serpent in the in the garden. That is, God did God say right? Did God say you have to go to confession to confess your sins? It is not so. Did God say that you need to receive the Eucharist and that's the body of Christ? It is not so. Did God say you have to be baptized to enter the, 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 the heavenly kingdom? It is not so. So again, very similar argumentation and style between the Protestants of the Reformation, they call it, or the Revolution, and, um, and, and, um, and the, the dragon, the serpent in the garden. And then we have this other parallel. So I talked about the Masons, right? And I, don't, and I say the Masons not in terms of 
that alone. It's really just esoteric sects, right? These mystical groups. It doesn't really matter if you call it by any name. It's just this idea of secret authority and power happening through magic and in hidden, um, hidden, hidden um, spiritual practices that are hidden from the from the public, and also coordination for control. And um, so we have an example of that in, in in Queen Elizabeth's court. There was a, a magician named John D. Who um, who who was trying to communicate and to and to um, I guess you'd say leverage angels in his in his uh, work and and he did wife swapping and all sorts of things were going on that went, got really crazy in his situation. But you can see the beginning of this Masonic and the Masons claim him as their own. They claim him as an early founder. And this is in Queen Elizabeth's court. So again, Queen Elizabeth is King Henry VIII's daughter. So that's right after the start, of the the founding of this Protestant revolution. We have John D showing where what the leadership in this revolution is doing, um, and that's why I think it continued to do. And so that's why you have a Protestant to Mason pipeline. And the reason why there's this relationship between the two is because they're one. the The leadership of Protestantism is Masonry, or is um, is esoter esoteric religion. Um, so then the first beast that comes up, I would say, is communism. And the reason I say it's communism is because it comes out of the water. Again, it comes out of all the people. It's a, it's a groundswell from the people's movement, right? And it has blasphemy that's all over it, I, I, that, that covers it. And it's a child of Protestantism and of Masonry. And what we know that, that communism is a child of, of, of Masonry, it's right in the history. If you just read the history of the French Revolution and, the, and how that was clearly related to the Masons, which again, related to the Protestants, so we we see this revolution giving birth to Protestantism or to um to communism. So again, it had blasphemous names written all over it because it hated God and the atrocities and murders and and rapes and disgusting things that happened with the advent of um of 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 communism um, are are clear. So I'd say the first beast represents communism. The second beast represents scientism. Notice it's a lamb. It looks like a lamb. It's weak little creature. And it had, you know, but but at the same time, it has the voice of a lion. And where is it coming from? It's coming from the ground. What is the ground? The ground is a hard foundation. So what we see here is that the 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 second beast represents in, industrialism. It represents scientism, worshiping science, worshiping facts, worshiping data. This is that second beast. And as it, it's born, um, it's it's born out uh, of 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 the it's in its place in time. It's after communism, and it gives credit, credit credence back to communism. And it does. If you look, the the scientific community, scientism, the the universities, etc., learning, education, point back and give credence to communism and masonry, and they defend them, and they and they protect them. And if in videos that talk about masonry, they have um, they have little caveats on the bottom that say this video is is from is you know. Warning: There's better information you can find somewhere else on on esoteric cults. Um, you'll you'll find. So, um, I see that I see that as a as a culmination or following from the beast uh, from the water is the beast from the from the land, which is the beast on hard facts. It's the beast that's grounded, and it's it is scientism. And then the third beast is very interesting because there's a big interlude of persecution, and this follows exactly what happened in history. So we have communism and scientism kind of grows, and we we have the, the advent of the um, of the revolutions, we have the advent of the French Revolution, the American Revolution, and then the communist revolutions again followed it through the 1800s, so it's the 19th century. And then finally, there's this interlude where it talks about all the damage done and the separation of the saints as this process was happening. And then we see rise up the the, the third beast ridden by a woman. And what what I see the third beast being ridden by a woman as is affluent effeminacy. And so this would be related to things like like um, feminism, but not not in itself. It it's just related to its affluent effeminacy, weakness, and 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 womanliness in the leadership of the of the of the masses. We'll say the people and um, childishness. It's uh, and it's and it follows from the hippie movement. And wh what is it? Why would it follow from the hippie movement? Or it has tied right to it. It's, it comes from this idea of Rousseau's natural beauty, Rousseau's free spirit, Rousseau's you know, and this is goes back all the way back to the Enlightenment, but that those ideas of Rousseau in the idea of nature is best, good is natural and and clean and holy is things that are untouched by things like religion or science or technology. That idea gave birth to hippie, the hippie movement, which is tied directly to 
um, this this woman. And so you see the woman riding the beast. She's riding on top of of the of the beast of the hippie movement, and she is the uh, the effeminate voice. And what what happens is every time something hard should be done, she says mercy. Every time something um, something that offends one of her her beastly children is, is said, she says, "Shut up, or I will bring the masses of the water against you. I'll bring all the people against you to destroy you." And so she 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 forces effeminacy and weakness on everybody in the culture through service to this beast. So these are the that's the overall kind of general general function of the of the three beasts, the rider and the dragon. It's kind of interesting. I had uh, an image generated, and you can kind of see this evolution happen here. It's, it doesn't have any figures, of course, because it's all um, randomly generated. But you notice in the middle, you see something that looks kind of esoteric, and it goes out into you see these Protestant figures, but you see Karl Marx or someone like Karl Marx on the top. So you see Protestantism and Masonry coming out from the middle, and then finally on the outside, like in the upper right-hand corner, you got a wild man. You know, you got the hippie up there. You end up having the poet and the hippie and the in the garden people and stuff like that up in the outer outskirts. So you see this birth from the middle of masonry into Protestantism and communism, and then finally on the outside you see feminism and you don't really see feminism here, but feminism and and um, the hippie movement, which I think is kind of an interesting thing. So again, if you look at the timeline, Masons and Protestants Revolution, 15th and 19th century, Communists and Socialist Revolution, 18th to the 20th century, Industrial Re Revolution and the Scientific Deification, 19th and 20th century, and finally, Natural, Wild and Free Hippie and Feminist Revolution, 20th and 21st century. So you can kind of see this, this um, culmination or this movement through time. Um, and we'll also discuss the Antichrist, uh, many versus one. Um, the, the idea, we always think in our, we always talk about, and I think it's a deception. We talk about the one Antichrist who's going to come. And I really think it's really important to realize the spirit of Antichrist is among us now. And he's been among us. It's that spirit which opposes Christ, right? And we're going to talk again. This is about useful analogy because Antichrist is a real spirit. It doesn't really matter if there's one in the future or not or how they're going to look or what the, it, all, all that we're talking about here is the analogy of what that person who opposes Christ effectively does, right? So we're talking about the opponents of Christ. And that's what we're saying with Antichrist. And I think that's what the original authors were doing as well. So they were talking about opponents of Christ. Now, how do they do that? So um, again, we're talking, this is a useful analogy. We're not trying to interpret or prophesy. We're just trying to look at uh, um, things that help us in living our lives. Um, so the man of so the characteristics of of the Antichrist are going to be two that really come out. And one is that he's a man of lawlessness, or he he opposes um, authority, the authority of the Father. He is especially a breaker of the fourth commandment. He believes in breaking rules, right? And then finally, he is a an opponent of Christ. And when I say opponent of Christ, I mean opponent of the Christ who calls for repentance and proselytizing. And I use that word because it's pejorative, but be basically bringing converts, right? He opposes the converting Christian and repentance. And so he's opponent of Christ in that way. And I, and I think that he is a man, that this spirit, the spirit of Antichrist leads us and it will lead us in our dreams. It will lead us in our, in our fear from the community. We'll have people that will, usually he leads through, through tactics of force, right? He leads through tactics of strong arming. Um, he utilizes tactics of all three beasts um, and the dragon. And we'll focus in this talk, though, because this is the time we live in. We're going to focus on the third beast and the woman. We're not going to talk about the other two as much, communism and, and the scientific revolution, though they are an important backdrop. We're going to talk about the third beast and the woman. So there's also um, a little latent after we talked about talk about the, the Antichrist and, um, and, and the beasts and the, and the dragon, we're also going to just have this basic background to it that that there are two ways, and this is throughout our, our the history of our scripture. It's a history of our tradition. Um, so the, the the Didache is the first catechism that Christians use, and it opens with the words, "There are two ways: one of life and one of death, but a great difference between the two ways." And you can see on the screen here Deuteronomy. Also, um, and this is the Old Testament under the law. Uh, the book, one of the books of the Torah talks about this as well. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and a curse. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed, their, your children, may live. Antichrist works with us through the culture around us, through popular, powerful culture, and also through our dreams, also through our constellations. He is an antichrist. Again, he, we think he's Christ. 
And that's the important thing is that we, he's an opponent of Christ, but we really do see him as a savior. And that's, he tries to take the place of the savior. And so he's doing that in everyone's life. And I say, he does that through their visions. He does that through their dreams. He does that through the people who talk to them and the culture around them. And he does things like this. So like he'll cause you to suffer in life. And then he will cure you with a caveat that that cure means you serve him. And so you will then align your vision of Christ with this weak and effeminate, merciful Christ. And in doing that, you will then have, he will then cure you to live, uh, have a happy life going forward. And you will, and basically you'll be afflicted and then he will cure you of his wound that he afflicted on you if you worship him. For the time will come in which this vile deceiver will horribly appear. The mother who will bring this deceiver into the world will be nurtured in vice from her infancy to her girlhood by the arts of the devil, living among the most abominable people in the vilest of waste places. Her parents will not recognize her, and those with whom she stays will not know her. For the devil, pretending to be a holy angel, will persuade her to go away from them and guide her deceptively as he wishes. She will separate herself from all people as to conceal herself more easily, and when then she will secretly engage in vile fornication with men, though only a few, defiling herself with them with a great appetite for wicked doings as if her holy angel commanded her to do this deed of shame. And in the burning heat of this fornication she will conceive the son of perdition without knowing which man's semen engendered him. And Lucifer the ancient serpent will take delight in this turpitude, and by my just judgment will breathe on the embryo and possess it with all his power in its mother's womb. And so that destroyer will issue from the womb of that mother, full of the devil's spirit. Then she will stop her habitual fornications and declare to the unwise and foolish people that she has no husband and knows not the father of her infant. And she will call the fornication she has done holy, and the people will think and call her holy. And the son of perdition will be nurtured by the devil's arts until he comes to full adulthood, always withdrawn from people who know him. 26. The Antichrist will learn magic from his mother, and God will allow it. And throughout this time, his mother, by magic arts of hers, will show him both to the worshippers and to the non-worshippers of God, and he will be seen and loved by them. And when he reaches maturity, he will teach a doctrine that is clearly perverse thus fighting against me and my elect. He will incite people to follow him by his domination and the wonders he shows, and he will acquire for himself many peoples, telling them to do their own will and not restrain themselves by vigils or fasting. He will tell them that they need only love their God, whom he will pretend to be, and then they will be delivered from hell and attain to life. And they, being so deceived, will say, Oh, woe to the wretches who lived before these times! For they made their lives miserable with dire pains, not knowing, alas, the loving kindness of our God. He will show them his treasures and riches, and allow them to feast as they will, confirming his teaching by deceitful signs, so that they think they need not restrain or chastise their bodies in any way. He will command them to observe circumcision in the Jewish laws and customs, but he will alleviate for them as much as they want the stronger commands of the law which the gospel by worthy penance converts into grace. And he will say, When anyone is converted to me, I will blot out his sins, and he shall live with me forever. I will throw out baptism in the gospel of my son, and scorn all the precepts handed down to the church. And he will say with devilish mockery, See what a madman that was, who through his falsehoods decreed that the simple people should observe these things. And then his mother will live in the most abominable places. She will be among, and this is really interesting because if you think about it, if we talk about that third beast, right? The idea is that it comes from wild places, right? It says that the third beast, the woman, um, it says that the woman comes from wild places and it says that the third beast was found in the wilderness, right? Again, with the hippies, with wildness, with lack of order, lack of control. And she comes out of the dark corners and we see that this is this gives us an idea of the, the, the Antichrist. And maybe this is a new thing where the Antichrist is having this kind of power, but I believe the Antichrist is active now. And he, and he comes from wildness, he comes from the dark corners, he comes from natural rejection of religion and um, wildness and rejection of authority. And that group is gonna have um, is going to where, be where the mother of the Antichrist comes from. 
both Antichrist and his mother separate themselves from others. And this is important too. So when we have visions or dreams or anything like that, we have a tendency to want to hide them and keep them to ourselves as hidden knowledge or we think it's right for us to do that, we should be very wary about that because I know the anchor and the feel that you get when you think you have hidden knowledge inside yourself. It's, it is like um, the ring. It, to hold knowledge and say, I have this, but nobody can know what I have in my, in my has been given to me is like that ring. And I believe that this is a, a characteristic of those who serve the Antichrist and the Antichrist and his mother themselves. And that is that they separate themselves from others. They don't communicate, they hide and they lie. And he's going to learn magic from his mother, and God will allow it. And he will, he, will lie, he will lie to make himself like the Son of God. People will think that he is the Son of God. He, and this is another important point. And we can see this in this culture that's, that's, been, that's come up around us, right? That the beasts do this. He kills those who deny him, crushing humility and exalting pride. And that is what this culture is doing. It is, it is, it goes with the powerful and it rejects the outcast. So, so if you want to look at, for example, in the church where things are the darkest, it goes towards the culture and says, I agree with that, punish and persecute the outskirts, right? It crushes humility in the small and it louds and praises pride and popularity. And it will do, so this is really interesting. It's, he's going to do, um, he, he and his servants will feign magic so people will see deeds being done but they will be simulacrum they will be similes of reality they'll only be sleight of hand that ultimately he won't be able to do real affect real things but it's all going to be through deception and that deception will be allowed to him by god to have but not to be able to have any real good effects so things like raising the dead and things like that but but they ultimately they will be not a full or or, or real version of that it'll be a deception that will lead it and we're going to hear about this from James Lindsay. He will pretend to be Christ and tell his followers that they only need to love their God and forego vigils and fasting and avoid sin and not have to worry about avoiding sin. And it's only a week. And, the, and then they have to live by only a very weak version of the, the Judaic laws. Nothing that's hard, but just basically realize, you know, respect this basic Judaic law is the way that, that he's going to lead his people, according to St. Hildegard. So now this is a talk from um, James Lindsay. Mikael Himala Kakadosh again Aleno Baklav Hagir Aleno Matana Haresha Vahara Mumiut Shel Hasatan. Mikael Himala. Okay, it's got the wrong link. That's all right. So that, I guess it wasn't meant to be. So I'm just going to go ahead and look at it. So James Lindsay, Lindsay talks about the uh, that the, that basically that there have been uh religions that have been existing alongside christianity for for thousands of years since before christianity they pretend to be philosophies they pretend to be religions they pretend to be science and therefore trick people into supporting them and that happens by generating a fake image of the thing that they're going to occupy and then moving people out of the real thing into the fake thing the way that you know if you're in the club, is if you understand their language. If you don't understand the language, you're not in the club. So then you're trapped in hyperreality, not knowing what's really happening around you. But if you know the language, you know what's happening, and you're actually using it to manipulate people and to move your agenda forward. So in this talk, I actually, it's called negating the real. We need to obliterate reality if we're going to substitute in a fake. There's no other way to get people to accept a fake reality. You have the power of your own senses. What do we always say when we want to point out a totalitarian thing? Don't believe your lying eyes. Don't believe your lying ears. Don't believe your own senses. Your senses actually allow you to contact truth. If you're Christian, you believe the law is written on your heart. It allows you to contact truth. They have to obliterate that. They have to negate your access to the real in order to substitute the hyperreal in its place. They can't give you the artificial unless they get rid of the actual for you. And that's very important to understand. But these secret religions, these true, the ancient ones, Hermeticism, Gnosticism, and so on, operate almost wholly on what's called negative theology. And there's nothing particularly wrong with negative theology as a tool within a theological approach. It's got a fancy name, in fact. Apophatic, I think is how you say it, or apophatic, 
theology, it tears down, takes apart, etc. It's compared against positive theology, which expresses the attributes of God, for example, and that's cataphatic philosophy or theology, if I have these things right. I don't do the fancy words as much as I should, I guess. But the idea of a negative theology is that you cannot possibly describe God as the highest being in terms of what he is. You can only explain him in terms of what he is not. So it's a negative philosophy. Oh, he's good. No, he's better than that. He's great. No, he's better than that too. He's the source of... Nope, better than that too. Anything you stick to him, not good enough, not big enough. So it's an inability to describe God except by saying what God is not. And these religions rely entirely on negative theology. They use very little or no positive theology. This, they think, is the only way to describe a totally indescribable God, which is the thing that they claim to believe. So when you have a religion like Christianity that makes positive statements about the attributes of God, they say that that must necessarily be a limited or false religion, and thus they have a higher or better one that doesn't have those limits put on it. And that's how they're going to move into that space and occupy it and create a fake Christianity that's better than the real Christianity and get people to fall into their cult trap. And these things literally have been called heresies throughout history or Christian cults or Christian-ish, I guess, cults, we could say, because they're not technically Christian. I don't want to really talk a lot about theology. I just want to be able to identify these kinds of ideas because negative theology morphed throughout these traditions as the, the, the Middle Ages came into the modern era and science and the Enlightenment progressed. They transformed into something that literally got named negative thinking. And another name for negative thinking is critique. And you hear the critique of pure reason. You hear critical theory. You hear Karl Marx say the ruthless criticism of all that exists. That's what they're talking about. And negative thinking... And the negative thinking has evolved into what we would call woke denunciation, if we were being very clear about what woke actually means. If we actually define what woke means, it's a process of knowing how to denounce something in a specific way that allegedly announces the possibility for something different without ever having to say what it is. And you'll notice that's what woke stuff is. That's racist. What are we supposed to do about it? Give me power. I don't know. They never have to make a positive argument. They only make a negative argument about how everything you can possibly conceive of is bad in some way. It's a, denun- a denunciation. And the, the, the Brazilian educator, the Marxist, Paulo Freire, said that what you do when you have a critical consciousness, when you learn to do negative thinking, is that you denounce in a way that automatically announces the possibility of something different, which you never actually have to articulate. And that's what I want you guys to understand is how it operates. It's very important that they never actually make a positive argument for their own position. They only make negative arguments against yours and make it so that everybody's confused and thinks, well, whatever we're doing now is bad, we have to do something, and they have something that's contained in give them power. And this is really interesting. So it's a, it doesn't ever, so when you're arguing with somebody who uses this type of philosophy, they always use, and this is that duality, they always use, um, they always use arguments of of opposing your arguments, but never they never validate their own position. They never defend anything; they only attack. So they use critique um, always, and so you'll see them. You'll notice that you don't know much about their position, but they talk a lot about your problems. You know, and that'll be a very that's a very that's a good tell to know you're dealing with an occult religion. You're dealing with somebody who's following the Antichrist. When you see somebody who's using who's not defending any stance but attacking yours instead. They don't tell you, they keep all of their information secret, but they go after everything you make public. It's the, and, it, and this is the foundation of all critical theory. You know, this is all, all I, the idea is that you constantly try to take things apart and you don't present. It's, it's not about presenting things, it's always taking things apart. It's, it's the foundation of woke thinking, for example. They never make, make positive arguments, their positions, but only criticize those of their opponents. They denounce in such a way that they never need to articulate a position. They will attack in such a way that, that they don't have to actually defend anything. They just attack. They're very secretive and hide their information. So um, what I, wanna put in, I, wanna, I want to posit is that the devil, the flesh, and the world is one way to say it, or the devil, the harlot, and the beast in our analogy of the, of the three persons 
um, emulate this functionality. So when somebody gets an, an admixture of the devil, the harlot, and the beast into their personal life or in their church, you end up seeing um, that what, what you have is you have a manipulator who has got personal and diabolical destructive motives, but they hide them and nobody knows them. That's the devil again. It's it's it, it's parallels to masonry and to um, and to esoteric religions and Protestantism broadly, but more more appropriately to to esoteric religions like masonry. But um, they will manipulate they they will manipulate the harlot, and then the harlot is caught in the spell of the dark triad person, and so they will use emotion, seduction, and um, all sorts of emotional ends to to subjugate the beast. So again, the harlot, it's an interesting thing if you think about the prostitute. Prostitutes aren't usually people like somebody who's like a feminist might say, I really like prostitution because women, it's the first profession they had and women had power in it. I know that was an argument that was being said some time ago by feminists. It's not popular anymore, I don't think. But um, it's, it's basically a, a freeing of women. But in reality, most of the time, women are tricked by somebody who says they're going to give their life to her. They want to be her one and only, and they're the top of the pack, and they're so popular. And they, 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 they basically separate that girl, isolate her, get her addicted to drugs, and then they leave her. And then they start um, prostituting her out on the streets to people. So it's usually like that. So basically, the harlot is a woman who's caught in the spell of this devil, of the devil or the dark triad. And she then uses her cries of she needs help, or she uses her seduction, or she uses her jubilation and joy and ex exaltation in order to um, subjugate the beast. She basically pays it forward to the beast. And so the beast represents the John, the socialite, the materialist, the greedy, the fearful people. And they basically are, they see the woman as the pinnacle of everything. And they see the, as the harlot presents itself where all the things of, oh, that tugs my heartstrings. Oh, I feel so bad for that. Or this is so wonderful. Oh, she's so beautiful. Oh, anything for, for her. You know what? My, my, my grandma is the best woman on earth. There's nobody better. Don't talk about my dad and my grandpa, but my grandma, my mom, oh, they're so wonderful. Moms are so great. So this mentality that's so popular in our culture, making fun of every dad on every TV show, this is that that glorification of the harlot who is working ultimately for the devil and is then um, going down to the beast, to then subjugating the beast through that process. So again, there's two there's two sides, right? The, there's there's and this is the duality, right? The unary duality of all conscious action. So we have on the truth, when it comes to our faith, for example, truth is willing to suffer for the truth, says it openly, right? Information is shared freely. Admittance to the truth. You don't have to like be a, from a certain family or do some certain crimes, etc. You just have to be a person who's willing to give of yourself entirely. And then, and it's not secretive and it's not elite, right? It's something that's shared. And, but at the same time, it protects its foundations. It has things it believes and it does not go out to things it doesn't believe. Right? It does. It doesn't present and say we believe this, but also everything what everybody else believes. It says we believe specifically this. That's what faith and reason and true um, logical thought um, present. These things that they defend and they put openly out there. Now, on the other hand, as the dark triad and the harlot and the beast are introduced into a conversation, this could be in a single person, it could be in a community, or it could be in a church, and it could be in a state. Right? They never. What you'll we'll, we'll see happen is the person, the interlocutor, the person who's talking to you will never elucidate or defend a position. They will work to utilize lies. They will always only represent advantageous information. They'll never tell you things that hurt their position. They'll be very careful to keep things flowery and right. Or if they tell you things that hurt their position, it's only because they know that it will work better to, get, to win you. They're not pursuing truth. They're pursuing victory. Their sources are hidden. You'll often not know much about that person. You'll just know that they always criticize you. They'll appeal and they appeal. This is the other thing is they'll always appeal to the nebulous. And that means like gigantic and uncountable masses. They'll say the everybody's against you. They don't like what you're saying. You're like nobody else. You're a loser. You're a weirder. You're an outsider. All the community is against you. And these are the arguments that you see. So basically, when you see these types of argumentation, they never elucidate or defend a position. They always attack. They don't. They always use, utilize lies. You don't seem to know anything about what they come from, what they believe. You just know they attack what you believe, and they always present advantageous information. Their sources are hidden, and they appeal to power to threaten you. They appear to power to humiliate you. 
then you know you're dealing with the dark triad. You're dealing with this dark force that is uh, basically a cudgel. It's like a it's a it's a it's a club to attack um, the followers of God. So in the church, you see this is I've got a picture here of uh, of a uh, of a snooty professor or like a. Um, yeah, kind of an, uh, 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 an up somebody who thinks that they're they're full of it, intellectual. And then you have the socialites. You see those laughing socialites. This is a good example of the the ways that you'll be presented with people who come from that crowd, the crowd of the of the of the Antichrist. They will present nebulous arguments about God. So there won't be anything definitive. You won't have anything you can hold on to. There won't be any real direction in what they say. They'll, they'll be basically saying you can do anything you want often. And they'll keep very nebulous and weakening. They'll have two places. They'll either be completely nebulous, open, or they'll say weaken the position you have. So they'll want to take away from the hardness or the, or the, or the um, austerity of the practices and beliefs that you have or that your team has or the, the truthful team has. So they'll be always presenting nebulous arguments. They always ch champion non-dualism. Why? Because they don't like the idea that there's conflict. They believe there's only one and that one is their position. So the devil does not allow any opposition. The idea that there is a duality and there's two ways, like Christ was very clear. He said there, you know, or the Didache is very clear. There are two ways, a way of life and a way of death. They say, no, there's only one way. Everyone's saved in the end. Or we're not going to talk about that question because I know you won't accept it. So everyone, you know, lots of people are saved, probably more than you think. And they'll argue for more people saved. They'll just argue as much as they can to gain ground in the direction of nebulosity, of taking specificity away and bring nuance in. Non-committal to any specific position and they gate and they also use like i said they gatekeep knowledge that's where they say we know you don't you can't know you don't have a degree and therefore you're an outsider we are the we're in the gnosis we are have secret knowledge and you are not somebody who can speak your voice should be quiet because you're not part of the in crowd you don't know and so that those forces the socialite laughing uh, crowd together with the snooty stuck up theologian or scientist will join together to to uh, enforce the devil's the the antichrist arguments in our culture today so in summary prophecies reveal christ leading uh, um leading uh, christ leading and antichrist deceiving side by side so we see these two side by side all the time in 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 history i'd say since christ came to the earth but i'd say especially now you see very loud the antichrist is winning in most spheres of our life the antichrist that 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 rebel argument that detractor is winning almost everywhere you, you that you that you go and talk to people and i, I would say he's not not even at the latin mass where you safe when you're sitting there talking at the end of mass, you're dealing with a lot of antichrist. There are a lot of detraction, a lot of not being specific and hiding and opposing truth and kind of just tearing and not not presenting anything, not being willing to take a position, but instead just to attack truthful positions. Antichrist can be seen in the community groups with persons and is very strong today. And that's and I think that that is reflected in this idea of that that example we showed of the woman and the beast, the third beast and the woman, basically um, nebulosity bringing to nothing, not answering questions, uh, free thinking, going away from rules, you know? And this is the profile of the Antichrist in our day. And he, he works through negative tactics. So he never takes a position that needs to be defended, but he's always tempting or attacking from no base. 